This is the lecture on replication. I was enabled to do the actual lecture cap capture in class. So this is just an extra one that I'm doing in the comfort of my office. All right. So by this point, you should have uh, watched the supporting lecture on um, the structure of DNA. And in there, I was talking a lot about primers. And this talk about primers was really getting you ready for replication. And so here, I just want to test, you know, did you, did you learn anything from that? Did you have a chance to listen? And have you, have you learned it? And so here's a question that I asked in class. So here's a DNA sequence. And for the underlined part, what is the sequence of the primer that would bind to that sequence? And so for you, if you just stop this uh, recording right now, you could try to answer it and then restart. So the answer is, first, it's important that you label the DNA. And as I said in the supporting lecture, that unless otherwise stated, we always assume that the five prime end is on the left and the three prime end is on the right when any kind of sequence is given. And this is critically important for um, designing the primer correctly. So now that we have this labeled, we look at the next, and this is what the sequence would be. So when the template strand on the top goes from five prime on the left to three prime on the right, the uh, primer base pairs um, to that region. And because it is anti-parallel, um, the five prime is on the right and the three prime is on the left. And since in, in all our, ex, our exams or anywhere, they, if you do biotechnology, you always record or report the primer sequence from five prime to three prime. There it is. So the sequence of the primer that would bind to that region from five prime to three prime is G, G, T, A, G, T, C, T. Great. to uh, this slide again. So this is how we ended the last lecture, talking again about um, how much replication is going on in your body. And depending on the cells that we're talking about, skin cells and fingernails and hair, they all go through um, cell division often. And right now that cell division is happening, cell division and replication is happening in your in these cells right now other ones are less frequent so like i said the hippocampal neurons only replaced two maybe three times in your entire life so we're going to look at the process of replication keeping in mind that replication of your genome takes about one hour so the length of time for you to listen to this lecture is the length of time that replication takes place in a cell and replicates your entire DNA, which is impressive. So just reminding you about complementary base pairing, and here are the parental molecules with two complementary strands of DNA. For replication to occur, they're separated, and then eventually um, daughter strands are created that are complementary to the original parental strands. And they're created in what's called a semi-conservative manner so that the daughter cells have a parental strand in dark blue and a new synthesized strand in light blue. And how did they ever figure that out? So I just want to take a couple minutes just to explain this very cool early experiment to figure out how is DNA replicated. So once they figured out that DNA was the genetic um, molecule, um, then they wanted to know, well, how do you make more of it when a cell divides? And so they had these three options of how it might happen. And so let's look at the top one, A, the conservative model, where you have in dark blue the parental cell and what the parental DNA looks like. And so after the first replication in this conservative model, the idea is that um, by some mechanism, the parental strand stays in one daughter cell 
and the other daughter cell gets an entirely new synthesized DNA. If that was the case, then in the second replication, um, uh, when there's four uh, granddaughter cells, if you want to think of it that way, one of those cells would have entirely the parental DNA and the other three would be entirely newly synthesized. So that's the conservative model. The semi-conservative model says that we start with the template, uh, with the DNA, parental DNA at the beginning in the dark blue, and in the first replication, those two strands separate and each daughter gets one DNA strand from the parent and one is a newly synthesized strand. So you can see that after the first replication, this DNA is the same. It has one newly synthesized and one parental strand. If we go to the next generation, of course, the parents of the second generation are the products of the first replication. The same thing happens, but the result is if we're looking back at whatever happened to those parental strands from the very beginning, you see two of the two of the granddaughter cells would have one strand of the parental strand and then a newly synthesized strand, and then the other cells would have entirely newly synthesized DNA. One of those newly synthesized strands would have a, uh, been created in the first replication, and the second would have been created in the second replication. And then the third model that they were throwing around as an idea was more dispersive, where you have your parental strands, and that by some mechanism, regions of the genome would be entirely parental and other regions of the genome would be entirely newly synthesized and in the in the daughter the other daughter cell it would be the opposite and then it would be kind of random uh, orientation of of um, uh, these not random but it would be sort of dispersive um, sim uh, newly synthesized and parental DNA very cool experiment how they how they tested this I'll quickly just go over it so we again we're trying to decipher whether it's the conservative model the semi-conservative model or the dispersive model for DNA replication and they do this by culturing uh, E. coli for example in a media where um, you have a heavy nitrogen isotope so N15 so it's heavy it's physically heavy and then you transfer that. So after growing to a certain amount of time, then you transfer it to medium that has N14, and then you allow the cells to divide. It takes about 20 minutes um, for, for cell division and replication to occur in, um, in E. coli. And then you look at the results of the DNA in those cells. So, um, after the first replication, the DNA is centrifuged after the first replication. And by centrifugation in this kind of gradient, the DNA will migrate according to its weight. So if the weight is very heavy because it has uh, the N15, it'll migrate far and go down further in the tube. If um, the DNA sample is light because it has N14, then it won't migrate as far. It's less dense. It'll be higher up in the tube. And so by um, centrifuging the DNA after the first replication, so after the first 20 minutes, you isolate the bacteria, um, you isolate the DNA, and you run the DNA in this gradient, um, you can separate um, the DNA based on weight. And then you do the same thing after the second uh, replication so simply waiting another 20 minutes and so by doing this they were able to identify um, that it's the semi-conservative model that is the way that DNA is replicated because of the results that we got as we see in the middle the only um, uh, model that fit the results was the semi-conservative and I'll just walk you through that so if you look at the semi-conservative model, the result that we got in the middle there had a single band in the middle. And that fits with what we have find in the semi-conservative model where after the first replication, 
every daughter cell has one parental strand that's heavy and one parental strand that's light. And the combination of this light strand and heavy strand makes the DNA migrate at a sort of intermediate level. The next thing, after the second replication, you can see that we maintain some DNA at that um, intermediate level, meaning that that DNA has one parental heavy strand and one newly synthesized strand, but also it has a higher band, which is indicative of DNA where both strands are um, light, both strands are um, newly synthesized. One of those strands newly synthesized in the first replication, the other newly synthesized in the second replication. It's a very cool experiment. Sorry about that, a little technical difficulty. Okay, so looking on the right side, we're looking at what happens in eukaryotic cells. And again, because uh, eukaryotic chromosomes are linear, not circular, and because the genomes are so large, obviously we don't have a single origin of replication. So we have hundreds of thousands, if not more, throughout our genome. And so replication occurs at the same time at all these, uh, starting at all these origins of replication. The replication bubble forms at all these places. Eventually, they get bigger and then fuse to make the two daughter molecules. And here's just a close-up of that, a little bit more. So um, three origins of replication, three bubbles with replication forks on either end that grow and eventually fuse to make um, the two daughter uh, DNA. So if you look at that two daughter DNA molecules, you can see that one molecule is, the one DNA strand is dark blue, that's from the parent, and the light blue is the, is the newly synthesized DNA. And the picture below is another gorgeous um, scanning electron micrograph of DNA, but this time from a eukaryote, where you can see three replication bubbles, two of them with arrows in them pointing at the replication forks. And then just another view of the same thing, again, um, three, uh, so that's eukaryotic DNA with three origins of replication, that three replication bubbles are formed and that there are replication forks at the end of each bubble and that these eventually fuse together to create, as you see in E, the daughter DNA. One is a one strand of DNA is a parental strand and the other is newly synthesized. All right, so now let's look at how replication occurs. And just to orient you, I'm just going to go back. Nope, it's not going to let me. If um, what we're looking at is a single replication fork, so if we had a bubble in front of us, this is the uh, replication bubble in front of us. This is just the one on the left. And so um, uh, we're just looking at a small piece of parental DNA. Of course, it keeps going in the five prime and three, dire three prime direction in both orientations. So in order to start replication at the replication origin, there's other enzymes that need to come in. The first one that you can see here in green is helicase. It binds in to the lower strand, as you can see here, and it runs in a five prime to three prime direction. And by doing it, it unzips the DNA. So it, it kind of forces the DNA strands apart. This causes a lot of tension on the DNA ahead of the replication fork. So you can imagine if you have a coiled elastic um, um, that mimics DNA and you start pulling uh, an opening in the middle of that elastic, it would cause extra stress, extra pressure, um, extra um, um, rotational strain on the, on the elastic. And that's the case with DNA. So ahead of that replication fork, you need another enzyme called topoisomerase, and it runs ahead of the replication fork, and whenever there's too much pressure on that DNA caused by helicase prying open those strands, then it nicks the DNA, and it unwinds, brrr, 
the DNA unwinds, and then it reseals it again, and, and the replication fork can continue. So we've talked about the helicase in green, topoisomerase in blue, and the other uh, protein that's super important for the start of replication is primase. So primase comes in, it recognizes uh, single-stranded DNA, it uh, creates a RNA primer, and it synthesizes it from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. It makes it on based on complementary base pairing. The only difference is the primer is or the primer that is made is RNA. So just remembering back to the structure of DNA, that primer um, simply has a, a, a different um, the backbone is just different because of the OH uh, hydroxyl group on the sugar. So the primase is creating a RNA primer. And I just want to remind you what's the overall thing that's going to happen in replication. And then we'll return to looking what is actually happening step by step. So remember, if you look right in the middle, we have the template strand, three time prime at the top. 5' prime at the bottom, you know that we're going to be synthesizing DNA from 5' prime to 3' prime, and we do it with complementary base pairing. And so we've got the template strand in dark blue, and to the left of that, the new strand. And you can see that that sugar phosphate backbone and the exposed hydroxyl group, which is the 3' prime hydroxyl group on that new strand. In comes a new nucleotide triphosphate. So you can see the three phosphates there. Um, the, new, the base is a base pair that's the T binding with the A, so it's the correct sequence. And as a result of DNA polymerase, as you can see in the middle, the pyrophosphate is released to be used for other things in the cell. And this nucleotide is added to the growing chain of that new strand adding another nucleotide to the three prime end of that new strand and creating a new three prime end. Okay, let's return to what's actually happening at the replication fork. So we've created, we've got an origin of replication. We've pried the DNA apart. And of course this happens in two directions, to the left and to the right. For the rest of this lecture, we're really going to focus just what's happening on the left of the origin of replication, but of course it happens on the other side. Um, and remember that not shown here is the helicase, which is unzipping the DNA, and ahead of that the topoisomerase, which is releasing that uh, rotational pressure on the DNA by nicking and sealing the DNA and allowing it to unravel. I've labeled the five prime and three prime ends of the DNA to help orient you in this case. And again, we're gonna focus only on the left side of this picture. And specifically right now, we're gonna look at the creation of the leading strand of DNA. Okay, and, and another reminder that the dark blue lines are the parental lines and the light bluish gray is the, is the newly synthesized DNA. So as you can see in that box, from the origin of replication, the newly synthesized DNA starts with the primer and then extends um, to the left in a five prime to three prime direction. So this is what it actually looks like if we were to zoom in at that replication fork, keeping always paying attention to the five prime and three prime orientation of things so you can see the parental strand on the top, five prime on the left, three prime on the right. Uh, we're just looking at that upper strand right now. You can see the helicase there trying to unravel things. But let's look at that top one. We see where the origin of replication is. And so this is what happens to the left of the origin of replication. So <clears throat> in came primase to make an RNA primer. <coughs> Sorry. And you can see um, it's in red, so because it's RNA, just to emphasize that. So several nucleotides of RNA is added to start replication, and it binds by complementary base pairing with the template DNA. 
And because that's there, because there's a small double-stranded region, that's all the DNA polymerase 3 needs to start replication. If there was no primer there, no region of double-stranded DNA, DNA polymerase would not know what to do. So it's, I like to think of it as a fussy enzyme where it's saying, I would like to replicate the DNA, but I need somebody to tell me what to do uh, and where to go. And that's what the primase does. So the primase has laid down the RNA primer, and then in comes the DNA polymerase 2, extends that primer by synthesizing from a 5' prime to 3' prime direction, as you can see. If we go to the bottom um, picture, you can see uh, what's happened a few minutes later, and you can see that that DNA polymerase can just keep going, extending that DNA, that um, that newly synthesized DNA really indefinitely. It can just keep going. And so this is known as the leading strand. The parental DNA um, is the leading strand template. That upper strand is the leading, tan the leading strand template. And this DNA polymerase synthesizing from 5' prime to 3' prime is creating the leading strand. And this is the easiest one to understand. And here it just summarizes the three steps again. The situation is entirely different on the other strand. So again, we're focusing only to the left of the origin of replication. And because of the, the polarity of DNA, it's much more complicated on the other side, on the um, what's called the lagging strand. So here we can see what's happening um, at um, with the lagging template strand. So in this case, in that previous replication fork, the um, lagging strand is, is, this is the one on the bottom. You can see that three prime end is on the left and the five prime is on the right. You can see the origin of replication, and what we're concerned about is the replication that occurs to the left of that, or upstream of that, you can think of. And so because DNA polymerase can only synthesize from 5' prime to 3', three prime, what needs to happen is that replication fork needs to open quite a ways to reveal a region where um, further upstream for the RNA primase to add a primer. So there you see the primase adding a primer of RNA that is complementary to the uh, lagging strand template DNA. And then once that is created, then as you can see up at the top, move down to the bottom, that's all the DNA polymerase needs to recognize that as the region to replicate and then extend that RNA primer on until uh, the end of the, uh, this area, which is right at the origin of replication. So it will continue in this relatively short piece called an Okazaki fragment. And so when we get to the bottom, so here's those three steps. Synthesis with DNA polymerase 3 continues until it gets to the end of that piece and bumps up against the primer for the next, uh, for the replication going in the other um, side of that replication bubble. And so what happens is we have a little um, break. And so um, we've Again, just to remind you, we have the RNA primer, we have DNA polymerase, synth 3 synth synthesizing the DNA, extending that, coming right up to the um, um, end of that piece and leaving a break. And now we can see a second Okazaki fragment being created further upstream. So you can see uh, RNA primer for fragment two. So way up there is another primer added, another Okazaki fragment being created 
by um, a DNA polymerase 3, and that's going to continue right up to the end of that black, black arrow. And then, um, right as you can see here, it comes right up to that black arrow, and then you can see um, um, a small break in the DNA. What happens at this point, as you can see in point number five, DNA polymerase 3 leaves. It's done its job. It's synthesized up to that break. It's a very fussy enzyme. DNA polymerase 1 needs to come in and kind of clean things up. And so what it does, it goes into that fragment 2, and it continues the synthesis um, of the DNA by looking forward, seeing the primer from fragment 1, kicking out, removing the RNA, and extending the DNA through that RNA primer. So removing the RNA primer, the RNA ribonucleotides, and replacing them with the correct deoxyribonucleotides. We just see that again, the three steps. And then we get to the bottom, and you can see that the RNA polymerase 1 has completely replaced the primer in fragment 1 um, with DNA, but still we have a small break. So in comes DNA ligase, and it forms the bond in the backbone between the sugar and the phosphate and seals the um, DNA. So um, these are all the steps again that you can see how it's happening. So in the lagging strand, a little bit more complicated. So as you can see up at the top, um, as we make that replication bubble, we need uh, while the leading strand is easy, a single primer synthesizing from there 5' prime to 3'. Prime. But in uh, the bottom part of that bubble on the left side, you can see the situation is different simply because of the, of the orientation of the template strand. So we need to expose more DNA in the bubble, leaving space for the um, primer for fragment 1 to bind, as you can see um, in number one. Once the primer binds, then DNA polymerase three will create that Okazaki fragment one. And then DNA polymerase three falls off. Then another primer goes further upstream, closer to the fork, to create the RNA primer for fragment two. Once that's created, then DNA polymerase three comes in and makes the Okazaki fragment or extends that primer to synthesize DNA. And it comes right up until it bumps up against the primer for fragment one. DNA polymerase three is removed and in comes DNA polymerase one um, to um, extend the synthesized fragment in fragment two. And it does so by looking ahead, seeing there's an RNA primer, removing those ribonucleotides and swapping those for deoxyribonucleotides and extending and removing the primer and extending the synthesis of the DNA onto from fragment number two to fragment number one, two different Okazaki fragments. And then to finish the job, in comes another enzyme, DNA ligase, which forms the bond between fragment two and fragment one by, by mending that backbone between the sugar and the phosphate. And here you can see um, sort of it in action at the replication fork. So up at the top, it can show you the origin of replication. We're focusing just what happens on the left side of the origin of replication. You can see how DNA synthesis of the leading strand occurs from a single primer where the lagging strand needs to be created by these um, small Okazaki fragments and many primers creating small pieces. All right just reminding you of, of what that looks like. And maybe this is a good time to recognize that the leading strand and the lagging strand 
are opposite on the on the right side of the origin of replication. And you can think about why that is. I need a picture of what's happening. Yeah, I'll just scroll through these. Uh, next week I'll show you a, a video on replication. We're going to skip this slide uh, until next week. Then we're going to focus on my replication, Lego land. So uh, here's what I'm trying to use as another strategy to help you understand DNA. And I love these Lego blocks because they have, they're polarized in that um, they have, the ends are different. And um, so in this case, uh, the bottom ends, as you can see here, are the five prime end of the nucleotide. And the uh, smaller end is the three prime end. And so whenever we're growing uh, DNA strands, we're always adding onto the top of uh, the three prime end of these, of these Lego pieces. And here I've distinguished DNA from RNA by having the DNA being the square Lego blocks and the RNA being the round Lego blocks. And again, I've shown that um, that as far as bases are concerned, the ribo in the ribonucleotides or in the RNA, we have a U instead of a T. All right, with that background, let's look at replication again and see if by presenting it in a slightly different way, maybe this will help you. So in replication, you've got a piece of DNA sitting up there at the top. You can see the five prime on the left, three prime on the right. It's just a piece in the middle. We're just trying to conceptualize this. In comes the RNA primer. So you can see it coming in with its five prime to three prime um, sequence from right to left. It binds, based, binds to the DNA based on complementary base pairing. And then after that primer has bound, then DNA polymerase can come in and synthesize the rest of that fragment until it gets to the end, whatever that end will be. So let's, uh, with that basic concept, let's look at a replication fork. Similar to what we were looking before, we're looking at a replication fork on the left side of the bubble. And just for uh, clarity, I'm just showing as if the DNA is cut off on the right, but uh, it just makes it a bit easier for you to, um, to visualize. So there is our part of our replication bubble, and we're looking at the replication fork. If you look at the parental template strands that we started with, I've labeled um, most of the five prime and three prime regions. So let's just look at the top strand in the top square the top strand you can see the three prime end the far right top of the parental strand in comes your primer which um, from five prime to three prime has a sequence g u c g and it binds to that leading strand template dna by complementary base pairing and is extended by DNA polymerase creating the leading strand. And so you can see that um, that newly synthesized strand has a small piece that is RNA in here for nucleotides and then extends. And as, as you look further down, you can see that it, it keeps extending as the replication fork opens up, the DNA polymerase can continue to create that leading strand. And it can go on, not indefinitely, but for thousands of nucleotides based on that single primer starting the DNA synthesis. Now I'd like you to pay attention to the bottom strand. And what's interesting is only after the fork has opened enough to expose more DNA on that lower, um, more template DNA, does it make sense for the primer to come in and bind to the lagging template strand? And so you can see here, the fork has opened enough. In comes a primer with a sequence from five prime to three prime of U, A, C, U. And what we'll see in the next slide 
is that DNA polymerase, a different DNA polymerase, not the same one that is working on the, on the leading strand, a separate DNA polymerase will come in, recognize that small area of, of double-stranded DNA, it will bind, or double-stranded nucleic acid, and re, uh, bind to that and then extend that RNA in a five prime to three prime direction. This is the creation of the lagging strand and it continues until it comes to the end um, of the DNA or usually bumping up to another primer as we'll see in a minute. So let's just take that lagging strand and just look at that and, and leave the leading strand out. So here we have the lagging strand template DNA um, at the bottom. So if we're looking at the top picture, that bottom strand that goes all across, it's five prime on the right side and three prime on the left, and the three primes off the screen there. That is your lagging strand template DNA. You can see um, that one primer, UACU, has bound to that in the complementary base pairing and has created an Okazaki fragment from there, um, going five prime to three prime, and created this Okazaki fragment that starts with UACU, um, which is the primer, and then DNA polymerase has extended that with A, G, C, blah, 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 et cetera, to the end of that piece of DNA. So that's one Okazaki fragment. As the replication fork opens a little bit more, it exposes more of that um, lagging strand template DNA. So then another primer can come in. And so the second primer is this, uh, as you can see there, from 5 prime to 3 prime, the sequence is C, U, A, G. It binds to the template DNA by complementary base pairing, and then along comes DNA polymerase. It recognizes that small region of double-stranded nucleic acid and extends that RNA primer with DNA, so that's what we're looking at in the middle, and extends that to the end of that piece until it bumps up against the primer of the previous fragment, the previous Okazaki fragment. So at this point, DNA polymerase 3 falls off. It says, I've done my job. In comes another DNA polymerase called DNA polymerase 1. And DNA polymerase 1 extends that um, DNA from the second primer, extends it by looking forward, seeing there's the primer UACU ahead of it. It removes that primer, those ribonucleotides, and replaces, replaces it and extends the DNA with deoxy ribonucleotides so that UACU is now replaced with T-A-C-T. -T. And so, um, so when, but we were left with a, um, a break in the DNA and um, because we've synthesized one Okazaki fragment um, and then create another Ogazaki fragment upstream, and then we've got a break between the um, three prime end of one Okazaki fragment and the five prime end of the next Okazaki fragment. And so to, to clean everything up, then in comes DNA ligase, and DNA ligase will um, seal that together. So basically binding the backbone between the sugar and the phosphate to create one DNA molecule. I'll just